honored to be invited here, but it's especially an honor for everyone here who is in the role of a professional, mental health professional, to have the opportunity to come together as equals with people who are survivors of psychiatric violence. Because this is really, as we know, the heart of what motivates Lang's work, and it's a tremendous opportunity for learning. So I want to thank all the psychiatric survivors here for sharing their experience. And I may forget this, please don't let me forget this, but we're going to be having a treasure hunt. It's one thing I like to do every year is have a treasure hunt at the end of this. So please remind me if I forget, we're going to be um, searching for, I got a, a copy of the a very nice edition of The Divided Self that you can find. It's actually, it's actually very, very lucky because it's a signed copy of The Divided Self. Wow. Yeah, signed by me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I looked at the others, but they're kind of pricey. And I'm like, you know. so, um, <laughs> But it's, it's still special, you know. It's still really nice. So um, let's see. I want to. I feel like I want to be closer, so I'm gonna actually make a gesture of closer, closerness. Um, I uh, let's see. I have a I have a Lang RD Lang page on my website, which is willhall.net Lang, and there's recordings of my past talks and some notes and all kinds of stuff there. Um, I also want to just very quickly say I'm, I'm a graduate student. I'm doing a survey on antipsychotic medication withdrawal. So if you have any interest in that or in connected with people who might want to take that survey, please let me know. Um, my book is for sale over in the corner. And I also do a radio show. You can go online um, and check out. And I'm very excited that Dina Tyler and our colleague Ilya Parishki and I are doing a workshop on August 12th, uh, which would be an experiential um, workshop on working with altered states and psychosis. And we'll basically continue a lot of the things that I'm going to be presenting here today. So why Krishnamurti? Why am I presenting about Krishnamurti? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm, actually I actually haven't even read that much Krishnamurti. I mean, I have a few books. And, but there was um, especially a book that I read and I've listened to over and over again, Freedom from the Known. and. Um, I just got interested in, in, in him as kind of like a parallel track. And there was so much resonance, so much resonance. At one point, I just asked, I think it was, was Mike that I asked, you know, did Krishnamurti, and what's the connection here? And then Mike says, well, Lang loved Krishnamurti. I'm like, Aha, OK. So, and then I um, had the opportunity to um, uh, look at some of the contents of the Lang collection online, University of Glasgow. And they have his personal library. It's all, it's all cataloged online in Street Glasgow. So you can see the books that he was reading and were influencing him. And sure enough, not only was there several copies of Christian Murray's books, including Freedom from the Known, but there was also a notation that uh, interleaved in Lang's edition of Freedom from the Known were dry roses. Mm -hmm. So there's something very significant here. And I, I just want to get right to the point because I want to um, I want to have a lot of opportunity for discussion. Really what Lang is on to and what Krishnamurti is on to, and again, this is just my understanding and my reading, is a, 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 a dawning of the horror that we live in a brutal and loveless world in many, many ways. That we live in a world where violence is normal. We live in a normalized condition of violence. In fact, I think it's pretty accurate to say that we live in a condition of normalized warfare <coughs> against the environment. And I don't mean the SEALs, I mean we, I mean us. We are destroying ourselves. Both Krishnamurti and Lang's talks in the 60s and 70s and writing cautioned us, unless we got it together as a species we will destroy ourselves. And we are no longer at the caution stage. We are at the it's happening right now stage. There's an insistent prophetic um, tone to Lang and Krishnamurti <coughs> of trying to wake us up. Um, Krishnamurti as a teacher was kind of notorious for being uh, rough and um, uh, forceful in some ways. And I want to say, you know, the, the bringing of them together is not um, 
because I, I want to emphasize their similarities as teachers. I mean, Krishnamurti was not a therapist, and as a teacher, he wasn't the kind of spiritual teacher that had individual relationships with students coming in and he would work with them. So the quality of listening, and, and Fred Joff really point, pointed this out to me, the quality of listening that you might pick up from watching a video of Lang and watch, watching a video of Krishnamurti is completely different. They have a d very, very different quality of what they're doing as listening. Krishnamurti is not a model of therapeutic listening by any stretch, but they have different roles, and I think Lang had many different roles that he played, and so um, the uh, um, the kind of the, the signature quote that you may have heard online from Krishnamurti is that it is no means of health to be adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I actually haven't been able to, that actually might not, not be a perfect, it might be a little bit of a misquote in Krishnamurti, but I haven't found a citation of that. But clearly that resonates um, with Lang. And um, I think that the essence of the response, the human response, has to be about listening. I think that's the heart of the therapeutic stance, is listening. And then when we talk about the return of the divine feminine, there's something about listening that's at the center of that, that we listen and participate with the earth rather than force and impose and create mental schemes and uh, deploy them instrumentally. So um, I, uh, um, in the 60s and 70s, Krishnamurti was incredibly influential and, and popular, as was Lang. So they are very much um, of their era, and they played the kind of a celebrity spokesperson in some ways, or a prominent spokesperson. They also um, they also influence Krishnamurti influences popular culture in this huge way. And there's a there's a very very super famous spiritual teacher from uh, science fiction and see if you can figure out who it is when I read you this quote from Krishnamurti. Try is one of the most dreadful statements you can make. I will try. There is no trying, no doing your best. Either you do it or you don't do it. Who's that remind you of? Yoda. That's Yoda. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, the Yoda the puppet kind of looks a little bit like Krishnamurti. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. This is, this is Lucas's milieu. This is the influence. So, um, the, uh, um, the, the, the convergences and the differences, the huge difference between them, but the convergence is really what I want to bring. And I want to bring my own, um, I feel like what we're doing here is, is much, much, much bigger than trying to improve the treatment of people who are identified as mentally ill. What we are trying to do is to overcome the violence of our world. And, um, the heart of that is the way that we pose the problem and the way that we think about it and the way that we conceptualize. Again, the listening. So um, there's a number of videos uh, of Krishnamurti Anderson. Uh, there's a Southern California teacher, I think it's G.W. Anderson. Great, great dialogues. Um, Christian Murray also has dialogue with, Chris, with Houston Smith. It's also really interesting. Um, but what I want to point out to you about Christian Murray's really interesting life and all his teachings, he was groomed, he was found as a, as a boy by the Theosophists in India. Theosophy was this huge esoteric uh, world unity kind of religion. And he was cultivated to be the world teacher. They were actually holding him up and grooming him and training him to be the world teacher. And then in 1929, at his debut in his task as the world teacher, he gives this very, very famous um, speech, um, Truth is a Pathless Land, where he repudiates the idea of the teacher and essentially says that you have to find it inside of yourself. And he turns against his own, his own profession, in a sense, which is also what, in a sense, Artie Lang did. And so the um, the flavor of this is from a Krishnamurti quote, and I think, if you, I think it, it identifies the paradox or the difficulty of studying Krishnamurti. Um, if I were foolish enough to give you a system, and if you were foolish enough to follow it, you would merely be copying, imitating, conforming, accepting. And when you do that, you have set up in yourself the authority of another. 
and hence there's a conflict between you and that authority. You feel you must do such and such a thing because you've been told to do it, and yet you are incapable of doing it. You have your own particular inclinations, tendencies, and pressures, which will conflict with the system you think you ought to follow, and therefore there is a contradiction. So you will lead a double life between the ideology of the system and the actuality of your daily existence. And trying to conform to the ideology, you suppress yourself. Whereas what is actually true is not the ideology, but what you are. If you try to study yourself according to another, you will always remain a second-hand human being. And Lang, we can put no trust in princes, popes, politicians, scholars, or scientists, our worst enemy or our best friend. With the greatest precautions, we may put trust in a source that is much deeper than our egos, if we can trust ourselves to have found it, or rather, to have been found by it. So both are rebelling, in a sense, against the violence of the milieu that ruled them. The um, Lang uh, grew up in extremely anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish context of Glasgow, Scotland. And then his mentor, uh, who he meets um, when he's older, is um, Joseph Shorstein, who's a Jewish um, intellectual, very much from the continental philosophy world, and kind of brings Lang into connection with um, the uh, Western continental philosophical tradition. And Shorstein was extremely significant for Lang. Shorstein was one of the very few medical doctors, he was an MD, medical doctors at, at his time, who was completely against lobotomy. Now, lobotomy now is seen as one of the most horrific examples of psychiatric violence because it's the physical mutilation of the brain of the other based on an ideology of seeing them as less than human because they are mad. And we now recognize that for what it is, but we don't. Lobotomy, the inventor of lobotomy was given the Nobel Prize. There's been an effort to try and rescind that prize. It's not been successful. And the mentality and the thinking behind lobotomy is the mentality of the violence of the world that we do to ourselves, that we do to, to nature. The split between subject and object discussed by Frick Joffre on our first day together as the Cartesian view that the other, the outside, is a machine that I can manipulate rather than the other, the outside, as a reflection of a system that I myself am in. And so Shorstein was against that violence, that systematic normalized violence. And Shorstein was a Heideggerian. And Heidegger, we know famously, was a Nazi at one point, and he, the, even the more horrifying thing about Heidegger's Nazism was he didn't really ever clearly repudiate it. And so what is a Jewish intellectual, humanistic intellectual, Joseph Shorstein, doing learning from Heidegger? Well, because what Heidegger was on about is that the violence of the Holocaust was actually the uh, tip of a much larger violence of the West and a Western way of knowing, a Western way of thinking. And that, I think, is what <coughs> is, is onto in his work, is how do we unearth the way of thinking and knowing about the other that's embedded in psychiatry and mental, mental health that is violent? How do we unearth that? How do we step away from that? How do we completely <coughs> transform the way that we interact with the other person so we don't perpetuate this violence in the therapeutic scene, the therapeutic moment? So when he goes to graduate school, Lang um, is in a room of other medical residents, and the teacher is showing a film. And the film is to uh, explain about human anatomy and physiology. It's a film of the human digestive tract. It's an x-ray film. It's an x-ray film of someone chewing and swallowing. You see the food go down into the stomach, and the food goes into the stomach. And Sitting there, Lang raises his hand and says, wait a second, how is it that this film is possible? Because we know that x-rays are very deadly. And exposure of x-rays to make such a film of someone chewing and swallowing would be killing them. And the teacher 
This is, this is recounted in Lang's um, early years memoir, Wisdom, Madness, Folly. So the teacher, when Lang asked this question, how could this x-ray film be possible? The teacher said, it's an x-ray film of a concentration camp prisoner made by Nazi doctors. And then continued with the class. And that was the moment that Lang describes that he recognized that he was immersed in a social, cultural milieu of normalized violence, that there was not shock and outrage and, and rejection of this. And so Lang writes that um, uh, Lang writes that we live in a social world that as a whole presents more and more the appearance of total irrationality. Normal men have killed perhaps a hundred million of their fellow normal men in the last 50 years. It is only by the most outrageous violation of ourselves that we have achieved our capacity to live in relative adjustment to a civilization apparently driven to its own destruction. Now, the um, real moment when I came to kind of realize this um, in my own experience, it started at the beginning of my, my uh, big altered state, my big psychotic state, you could say, that led me to being hospitalized. And I was working on an academic paper. It was about the environmental movement. And the, a magazine, there was a magazine called Life Magazine. It used to be a photographic magazine. It's no longer around, but there was a magazine cover, Life Magazine, and it had an image of Mars. And the article was about colonizing Mars. And the headline of the article was Our Next Home. And I, I looked at this, and it, it, it felt to me like you know, looking back and learning about Lang, I was in that same moment of waking up to the fact that something would seem so normal and so commonplace, and yet if you look more closely at it, it is horrifying to think that our culture would consider the idea of leaving the earth in any kind of rational way. And Lang writes that, um, well, I guess I should say that, that you know, I'm not, I'm not um, invalidating the fact that some people do have positive hospital experiences. Some people do feel that they have sanctuary experiences and respite experiences in the hospital system. That was not my experience. And a lot of people have their uh, psychiatric treatment as a form of violence, and they understand that and see it that way. Um, my, um, my own um, interest in Lang has to do with the recognition of the intimacy of that violence, the, the depth of that violence. Um, Lang writes that, and this is a very strong thing, more completely, more radically than anywhere else in society, the schizophrenic is invalidated as a human being. So, What's important and what's significant about criticizing psychiatry is that you kind of take the moment where the normalized violence and the failure of knowledge and the failure of the Western way of understanding, you take that moment at its most extreme as a window onto the whole society. And that, I think, is what we're, we're doing. That's what we're here for. That's what the legacy of Lang is for, is for us, for us to unearth this and understand this. My, um, my own experiences, uh, I just am thinking of a couple of, of things. Um, one is that I was, I was in a very disoriented state. I was very, very confused. I was hearing very aggressive voices. I wasn't able to put words together. I was very terrified, very frightened. I had been in the hospital in the lock ward of Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute, which uh, incidentally is where Gregory Bateson did his study of communication. Mm -hmm. Schizophrenic, so I kind of had a parallel education in some weird way with Gregory Bateson. Um, but uh, not the kind of thing you put on a resume. You know, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, he was at Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. And so I remember I was in the middle of the night and I, I was trying 
to just put things together. Nothing was coming together in my mind in this terrified state, which of course I was told was a symptom of my schizophrenia, my psychosis, but anyone who's been truly terrified knows what it's like to not be able to put words together in your head. Um, there was a moment where I just thought, I just, I just need to talk to somebody. And that was as far as I got. I just need to talk to somebody. So I woke up, stepped out of bed, and I just walked. And when people, and there's like six people in the room, and they're all asleep, and it's dark, and the door is, is there's light, and it's open. And I'm, so I walk, and I step out of the room, and I say, I just, I just, I just, I just. And then suddenly, I hadn't seen her, but a woman stands up and says, get back into your room. And I was completely... I was in such a fragile, vulnerable, I was all I could do to just adjust. And then I'm, and then she sees that I'm not responding. And so she escalates. This is how the police kill people. They provoke, terrify, the person does not respond in a compliant way, and they escalate. So she escalates, she comes out from behind the desk, and now she's saying, Mr. Hall, go back in your room. You're not allowed to be out of your room. We told you this. Go back in your room. And then she escalates more. And now I start to say, what? What? And now my voice is raised. So that scene is repeated over and over and over and over again. I um, was put into an isolation cell, which is um, what do they call that now? A seclusion, a seclusion room. I was put into a, I was put into a cell, a solitary cell, and um, as I was trying to exp explain or something, I was, they were threatening and they told me that they had to, and they, at one point they said that they would strip search me, and I, I, there's a point at which you're so terrified that you, you dissociate and you lose consciousness and it was a traumatizing experience and it was only when I got my files years later, which is a whole other story, that I read that I didn't just black out and go to sleep when I was in the cell, but I was screaming, I was in a completely traumatized dissociative episode of which I did not remember anything from and I still don't remember that's probably the scariest part of my hospital experience. Is that I, there's things that happened there, things that people said to me, things that I watched, things that, I, things that were done to me. Now, there was another moment, and this was when I was on the, the open ward. And the thing about the open ward was that it was open, but if you tried to leave, they would put you on a closed ward. So I'm not quite sure what definition of open there using there, but people who've been in the system know that the, there's something called voluntary and involuntary, where you're, you're admitted voluntarily, but you can't leave, because if you're admitted voluntarily and you try and leave, then you'll be admitted involuntarily, so you can't leave. So this is the kind of routine logic that happens in the psychiatric system. So I was there, and one of the things that I did was I had, they have awesome art supplies at Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. They had a lot of really good art supplies. So I would, I would just draw things, and I drew these little maps with these kind of poems. I was very in, influenced by Edward Borey, Ashley Crumb, Tiny's, I was like, so I had these little, very dark kind of thing I was doing. And at some point, I don't know whether it was me or, but they would put our art up on the wall. Kind of like you do at child care centers for six-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> and so my um, art is on the wall, and I was in the, dining hall, and I, I saw it. there were these two young, I guess they were residents, or they were interns, working there as part of the psychiatric staff, and they were going from art to art, and they were just sort of looking at it, and they had stopped at mine, and they were pointing, and they were laughing, and they were smiling, they were really enjoying it. So, you know, a part of me is like, hey, I'm at an art opening. You know, I'm, you know, I'm at a gallery, and these are people, maybe they're going to buy my work. So, you know, I just walked up to them, and 
I just said, hey. And they were, very, they were quite surprised because they didn't see me come up to them. And I said, you know, I, I was starting a conversation. I said, you know, I, I do that. And they, they had blank, suddenly had blank expressions. They did not make eye contact with me. They didn't say anything to me. They turned their backs to me and they walked away. Now, I have to ask some of those who are trained in psychiatric, psychodynamic, something, something, something. I'm sure in some textbook somewhere, there's a rationale for what they did, they did. But it was also an act of violence. And so we see that there's something, there's some thread. And the thread, this is what Lang describes as what violence is. The thread is the denial of reciprocity, that we have a mutual presence. And it's a reciprocal presence, just like a mirror. And when you deny that reciprocity, you inflict violence. Just looking at my notes here. Um, now, um, I think we have about 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. So then, um, then what, what are we doing? And this is a, a, an answer to the question, what is psychotherapy? But this is also an answer to the question, what are we doing here? And Lang's answer is, psychotherapy must remain an obstinate attempt of two people to arrive at a recovery of the wholeness of being human through the relationship between them. That's what we're here to do. I, I haven't, I don't have an answer for what is love. I um, study and understand violence. My, my sense of what non-duality is is something about that reciprocity and that mutuality being absolute. There's only one person in the room, there's only one organism in this space. My sense of what we're doing when we're doing therapy or doing psychotherapy with people who have that identity is overcoming the otherness that we're very simply trying, we're just we're doing our best to not inflict violence by rendering the other as an it and denying the fact that that's also me. I think that there was something in the early psychedelic days of let's understand people who are psychotic by taking psychedelics. And I think there's actually a lot of validity in that because I think that the heart of why someone would yell at someone and put them into solitary confinement or why two residents would just shut out a human being interested in their response to that human's heart I think at the heart of that is, is fear. And I think that fear of what's inside of ourselves motivates a lot of people to, into the helping professions because they can then project it onto the other and control and manipulate and feel separate from the thing that they're afraid of themselves. So Krishnamurti says that what we're really working on is, is fear. And there's a quote that I like from William James and he says, William James is the famous psychologist who wrote the varieties of religious experience, and a very smart guy from the 19th century. Um, the greatest moral failing of the educated classes is the fear of poverty. And I think that we're all gripped by a certain kind of fear. And Krishnamurti writes, what is needed rather than running away or controlling or suppressing or any other resistance 
is, understand, is understanding fear. That means to, to watch it, to learn about it, to come directly into contact with it. We are here to learn about fear, how to not escape from it. I think that's the pathway to love. We are all acting like we're not terrified, but the Vietnam War, which was on television, the first war on television, was showing the world what might come if we don't wake up. And now we're in the space of it's here because we're not waking up. And I'm not sure what to say about how each of us can wake up, but I think that the, the central place of fear in that is something that both Lang in his understanding of psychiatric violence in that moment of breaking the, the mutuality and Krishnamurti and his, his work are both working on. So I want to read um, something from Krishnamurti that I think starts to get at this. So and at the end of his life, Krishnamurti was encouraged to create a journal, which he did by just recording, just speaking into a reporter. And this is from that. There is a tree by the river and we have been watching it day after day for several weeks when the sun is about to rise. As the sun rises slowly over the horizon, over the trees, this particular tree becomes all of a sudden golden. All the leaves are bright with life, and as you watch it, as the hours pass by, that tree whose name does not matter, what matters is that beautiful tree, an extraordinary quality seems to spread all over the land, over the river. And as the sun rises a little higher, the leaves begin to flutter, to dance. And each hour seems to give to that tree a different quality. Before the sun rises, it has a somber feeling, quiet, far away, full of dignity. And as the day begins, the leaves with the light on them dance and give it that particular feeling that one has of great beauty. By midday, its shadow has deepened, and you can sit there, protected from the sun, never feeling lonely, with the tree as your companion. As you sit there, there is a relationship of deep, abiding security and freedom that only trees can know. Toward the evening, when the western skies are lit up, the setting sun, the tree gradually becomes somber, dark, closing in on itself. The sky has become red, yellow, green, but the tree remains quiet, hidden, and is resting for the night. If you establish a relationship with it, then you have a relationship with mankind. You are responsible then for that tree and for the trees of that world. But if you have no relationship with the living things on this earth, you may lose whatever relationship you have with humanity, with human beings. We never look deeply into the quality of a tree. We never really touch it, feel its solidity, its rough bark, and hear the sound that is part of the tree. Not the sound of wind through the leaves, not the breeze of a morning that flutters the leaves, but its own sound, the sound of the trunk and the silent sound of the roots. You must be extraordinarily sensitive to hear that sound. The sound is not the noise of the world, not the noise of the chattering of the mind, not the vulgarity of human quarrels and human warfare, but sound as part of the universe. It is odd that we have so little relationship with nature, with the insects and the leaping frog and the owl that hoots among the hills calling for its mate. We never seem to have a feeling for all living things on the earth. If we could establish a deep abiding relationship with nature, we'd never kill another animal for our appetite, we'd never harm. We would find other ways to heal our wounds, heal our bodies. But the healing of the mind is something totally different. That healing gradually takes place if you're with nature with that orange on the tree, the blade of grass that pushes through the cement, and the hills covered, hidden by the clouds.
too many details because we are already at the closure of the session and other people oh, have okay. questions. Okay. Yeah, so please, if again. you want to hear the rest of the story, talk to Stephen outside at the deck. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry Thanks. for interrupting you. Anybody else? Yes? Um, I, I really appreciated what you said, the point about not doing violence by treating someone as an it. And just very quickly, it made me think of a patient of mine who suffered horrible trauma at school through bullying, but then the trauma of that, which is actually physically deformed his body, mm -hmm. is nothing compared to the psychiatric treatment experience ongoingly through his adolescence and his feeling of being an object. He always says, I wasn't a person, I was an object. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I haven't thought of that as violence, but that's a good way of putting it. So, yeah. And when I present him in supervision, <coughs> I always ask him, you know, if it's okay if I talk about him, <coughs> and he says, please don't um, let them call me a fascinating subject because that's so, mm. this uh, idea of being objectified. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I like the, the people mm. that violence. Yeah, my father, is a, my father is a torture survivor. And apparently how prison guards, whoever, are able to torture another human being is that that is some kind of mechanism or mental, emotional scheme that's brought in of the other is not human like they are. Mm -hmm. The other is now just an object. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Fernando? It, it, it strikes me, thank you, first off, 
right? I wasn't expecting to cry this morning, but you went ahead and did it. Um, so thank you for that. But it, it just, as you were talking about like the pictures and putting them up and your drawings and all this, so in you just in you know working in a field and having to visit you know a lot of patients in like locked wards and stuff like this over the years, and like psychiatric emergency services at at um, SF General. I was there. <coughs> oh right. Yeah. Okay. It always struck me when I would go in there, and I went in there a lot, was just how damn scary it was. And while you were talking, what really, like, the sort of, like, two things that came together very quickly in my head were, yeah, there is the fear, of course, right? There's the, there's the fear that something's manifesting in the other that, of course, is in us. And so, yeah, we got to, like, lock it away and all that. And I think, I think most of us in this room hold that. But what struck me as something novel and new that was generated by your, like, very sort of genuine words about all this was... There's also a wanting to punish the other. How the fuck do you allow this happen to you because it brings it up in me? Mm. There's something recriminatory, like punishing and menacing. Because I, I go into these wards, I'm like, why is it so damn scary here? Like, you hear the lock really lock, mm. right? You hear the door slam really hard, right? Things are, it just looks scary. It sounds scary. It feels scary, right? And I think there is that part. There's this this in, intense fear that then devolves into something instead of like facing it, it devolves into something further which mm -hmm. is this wanting to punish the other for having allowed themselves to go there mm -hmm. right because yeah. it means i'm that much closer to that mm -hmm. right? someone, uh, someone mentioned lang's uh, christianity of course what you're describing is kind of the central myth of that the, the one the one who shows us pure love we just want to kill it. There's a scapegoating that's at the heart of right. all this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Lang would have said it's the fear of madness, but not the other person's, your own. Your own. Yeah. Yeah. And what would it be like to just shed all fear and then just live as Christ wanted us to or live as something? Would, I mean, maybe something, maybe something like that, something very radical in all of us is needed and maybe that sounds a little crazy right now but check in with me 15 years from now you know how how pressing is this world collapse going to be right on our bodies that we have no choice to just avoid facing the fear we have to make very radical sacrifices up to the sacrifice that christ presented us with and so many revolutionaries of one sort or another and i'm just yeah, Nita, this will be the last, then we have to stop. Okay. I learned something very important for me, and what you said about um, there's value in taking psychedelics in, in order to be with people who are in states of madness. And just from this whole conversation, it, it did suddenly occur to me, what you're really talking about, or what I, and my takeaway from it, is that getting out of fear of your own madness mm -hmm which psychedelics might do for your shamanic breath work does for you too to some extent. Mm -hmm. There was someone yesterday that talked about that, just the fear of going out of being out of control. Out of control. Right. Yeah. So if we could all practice in little or big ways being out of control, there might be less fear. Because that's what we're really afraid of is our own. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. <laughs>